get into it. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Creative's Point of View podcast. My name is Ethan. Noah. And today we have Alex Barnes. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Cool. Glad I got the intro right. Noah, yeah. introduce him. Yeah. So uh, I met Alex, what, like two, three years ago? Yeah, man. Oh, man. Photography stuff. Way yeah. When. Yeah. We were doing photography stuff together a little bit. Uh, we did a dope photo shoot at like this old gas station in this small town, Prairie City, Iowa. Dude, yeah, so it was, long ago. It was kind of iconic though. No, literally, those photos went hard, bro. They yeah. went so hard. Were they? Did they used to be posted on your Instagram? Yeah, like way like, on if, Iowa ports way back. or anything. You, like that? you got yeah, them up? They're still on mine. Okay. I'm gonna have to look at them. Yeah, yeah, they were they were fire, bro. Because yeah. at the time, I was like in this like kind of like film nighttime photography, like like I don't know. That was kind of my thing. It like, was like heavy when grain was really popular in photos. Yeah, really yeah. Popular. That's crazy. We can get into that too today. Yeah. I mean, I would love to hear your your take on that whole yeah. thing. But uh, yeah, bro, like we met back then, like whenever that was. And uh, now you're out in Arizona, uh, at Arizona State doing like film school. Yeah. yeah. Want to be a cinematographer? Yeah, I hopefully want to be a cinematographer, or like second AC, something on something in the camera department, really, just yeah. in Hollywood. That's yeah, fire, that's bro. Cool. Yeah. Man, that's cool. So, so what got you into that? Um, Yeah, dude, really, it was uh, wanting to be an actor <laughs> because I was in photography initially, but I'd never like wanted to pursue photography as a job. I'd always like really thought of it as a hobby. And, but then my sister was on Broadway when I was a kid for like four years. And so I was exposed to like a lot of that side of stuff, like mm -hmm. acting. And from there, I was like, randomly when I was like 16, I was 17, I was like, yeah, I want to be an actor. And then I went to like New York, went to like this big acting thing there for like three weeks, was in like six or seven short films, met a bunch of filmmakers and photographers from like different countries and stuff. We're at like this camp. Mm -hmm. um, and from there, I uh, came back here and I was like, wow, there is nothing here. For, yeah. Like acting and I didn't know really of the creative scene here at all at that time it was really just me being self-motivated and I was like well I don't know anybody here I don't know about short films happening here so like I'll just make my own and then from that I ended up making two films one I never showed another one one honorable mention at the LA Film Awards and oh. got like a uh, finalist for a different film festival in New York and then uh, from that I just went into more producing my own stuff for film and I kind of got better and better and more interested in behind the camera stuff and then I was kind of realizing acting is pretty difficult and so I kind of like started stepping away from that and focusing more into film but I hadn't like dove deep yet and it wasn't really until like last August when I transferred to Arizona State that I really like dove into it mm -hmm. and decided yeah I think I'm gonna do film like full-time yeah dang did you pack. did you like just jump straight into like film and like video or did you kind of start with photography and use that as a way to like kind of like jumpstart yourself yeah so knowing how to take photos i thought would be like super easy to get into film i was like yeah i knew this it'd be so simple easy and it was in terms of using the camera and knowing how it functions but then in terms of like actual cinematography type things it was a lot harder because i didn't realize like how important lighting was mm -hmm. how important color grading was how to actually color grade properly and mm. so, like, it was a big learning curve once I actually started to get down to the technical things and then having to understand different lenses can't go on certain cameras because of certain sensor sizes and certain this and certain that mm. and how diffusion and negative fill and all this other mm. cinematography terms work together. And that was, like, a whole lot to start, like, learning about. And then mm. I was, like, really diving into it then because it just really piqued my interest. And yeah. it was a new challenge after photography had been, like, seemingly pretty easily done after a couple years of doing it. Yeah. So what age, like, were you when you realized, like, okay, I want to do this? Um, like, with film? Yeah. Yeah, I was probably, like, 21. 21? Yeah. So not too long ago. No, yeah. I've okay. only, like, really been doing film, focusing on it for about three years. And then, as I said, like, in August, we're really jumping into it. That was, I've learned so much in the last, like, 10 months. Yeah. Okay. What was your first uh, camera that you uh, started to shoot films with, and what do you currently have now? Um, so I started just with what photography camera I had and I, I still have it. It was a Sony a7R2 mm -hmm. and, uh, that was just the best one I had. And that was what I went with. And now I've upgraded to using a black magic 6k pro. That thing is a beast. Yeah. Like, so amazing for film. It has built in dual native ISO built yeah. in diffusion. Like mm -hmm. so, so good. Yeah. As the air kicks on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That. Um, yeah. 
But uh, okay, your first video you ever did, do you remember what that was? And can yeah. you tell us about it a little bit? Yeah, so it's actually on my Instagram as well. It's called Isolation. That was the uh, one that I submitted to the, some of the festivals. And that ins- got inspired because it was during quarantine. I was so bored. Just mm. really like kind of lonely cause, like everyone else probably was. And I was just like, man, what can I do right now? Because no one could take photos. No one could really do anything. And I was like just sitting on the ground, just looking in my mirror. And I was like, huh, this would be a really cool shot. And then Hmm. I just grabbed my camera, recorded that shot. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, I think I can make a story about this on like the effects of being isolated alone. And I kind of just built it off of that. And I just made like a super short one. It was only about a minute and 30 seconds. And I kind of just built it off of that idea. And then I just added a couple more shots into it and then edited it together, got some music and then (laughs) good to go. It was like really did it all in like a day. It was pretty, pretty simple. That's dope. Yeah. Was that the one that you submitted to the competition? Yeah. 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 And so you said that was the runner up or? Yeah. It it got honorable mentions to second place at the LA Film Awards. And then it became a finalist at the New York International Film Awards. Wow. Yeah. And then. It's crazy. And then uh, it was selected for a couple more. I just can't remember them off the top of my head, but. Mm. It costs a lot of money to submit to festivals, so I didn't submit to that many. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome, though, man. New York and LA representing. Yeah, dude. Dude, it's crazy. So we had a like a fashion designer, uh, Riley Smith, on a few episodes ago, and like she was like submitting her her like uh, collections that she was designing while she was at Iowa State to like global competitions, wow. and she was she was in like the top ten globally for things, right? And yeah, the fact that you're out here like. Or submitting one of, stuff. yeah one of four in the in the country yeah wow. yeah like, yeah yeah, yeah it was crazy. it's just crazy how much talent like iowa has Dude. Like, Underrated, man. yeah Bro. everyone that meets me thinks i'm not from iowa like you should yeah. where you from and i go iowa they go no way yeah, yeah. could have swore you're from new york or la or yeah. this yeah. or that then no <laughs> one suspects iowa that's literally the last place they think they think cornfields 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 yep. yeah no one thinks anything else comes from here yeah, yeah. and it, who was it who are we talking with about, or was it Brandon who was saying like, just the influence that you can kind of like, I don't know, transplant like to other places. It's mm-hmm. like, yeah, like Iowa doesn't really have anything to scale like New York or LA, but it's still like, I don't know. There's just so much here that's just hasn't been uncovered. Exactly. Yet, it's just you know? so untapped here. Yeah. And there's so many creatives that also don't even know that there is a scene that they can get into. Exactly. And like build yeah. more connections off of. Like, yeah. 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 Um, what are some current projects that like you're working on, whether it's like passion projects, school projects, client stuff? Like, do you do client stuff? Yeah, I'm starting to try to delve into it a little more with video, but as I'm still relatively new with it, I don't want to like promise stuff to people that I don't know if I can perform yet, but I am starting to try to delve into it. We have a mutual friend that Mm -hmm. I'm going to be working on a video for. I'm not going to say what brand or what it is just to keep that under wraps for him. And then, uh... Yeah, in school, we have the our capstones coming up. That's basically just our senior films. And I'm signed on to one of those that's in the beginning stages of pre-production. It's called The Busser. It's basically a, about a kid who kind of had trouble with his life and he's kind of not knowing where he's going. He gets a job at like a fast-paced Italian restaurant and then kind of just gets tested with his strength and his abilities and by the other people around him having to deal with like people in the real world kind of thing. Mm. That's pretty much what that one's about. And then there's a couple other films I'm signed on to and one of them is called Eight and she doesn't really want to give too much away so I'll just kind of really tip around it. It's like a, kind of a, a thriller, kind of like a mind-bending film. And then... My favorite. Yeah, yeah. And then I have a couple other ones that people want me to be the DP for that they just haven't like developed yet. But most of the ones I'm working on right now are all in the early stages of pre-production. Fire. That's dope. Yeah. How how was acting, like how has acting uh, influenced your filmmaking? Oh, yeah. So because I like did all of it myself when I did make the films for acting, I got like pretty into all sides of it where I like I was the editor I was the sound guy so I like had to learn how to do a lot of that stuff myself which has helped me come into film where like if people can't do something I normally can Mm -hmm. and so like on one of the films I just like uh, had come out that was called My Privilege I was like the producer the editor the sound mixer like the cinematographer like I did wore a lot of hats on that like and I think that's been pretty helpful with that because if 
people need help or on sets or in other positions, I'm able to like be like, yeah, I can do that. Or I have at least a basic knowledge of this where mm. I can offer some assistance. You know what I mean? For sure. It's helped mm. have like a more well-rounded view. And I think that's also needed on a set. So you like, you know how stuff functions. And so if someone's not doing something right, you can tell them what they need to do better yeah. type thing. Especially like from a director's role, like if you have trouble uh, communicating like a vision that you want or like, and, or they're just not executing it. Oh, like, yeah. uh, like, let me kind of come alongside and like, be like, no, let me, exactly. let me help like direct no, what exactly. I want to happen. And like, yeah. as a director, that's the biggest thing you need to know is all these other positions and how they work together. Cause that's how you're going to effectively communicate your idea and get right. the exact thing that right. you want. Yeah. Wow. How many hours are you putting in when you're doing all those things? Like, <sighs> man, uh, it's gotta be a lot. Yeah. So like, just the film that we just released called My Privilege, after we were done shooting it, it probably took three months of like another 150 hours of editing, of like re-editing and going over it and refixing stuff, refixing the sound, adding mm -hmm. more Foley in. Like, yeah. we, we could have stopped probably earlier, but we were like just adding as much as we could to try to make it as best as we could. So yeah. there's like all of that. And then with pre-production, you put in however many hours you put in is how much less time it's going to take on production. So you want to like really hammer in as many as you can because it will save you so much time having like shot light, lighting diagrams, shot lists, like mm. permits, everything already is set out. Like so pre-production is like honestly the most important part of developing a film because yeah. it's what you focus and look at to make everything else happen. And once you do that, you do good in production. Once you do good in production, it flows into post-production and the editor can have a way easier time making it all happen and come together. Mm. 100%. Yeah. Um, okay. What's the most challenging part about making a film? Ooh. Yeah. Um, Before he answers that, I'm just going to say budget. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Low key. Yeah. yeah. Low no, key. Really. Budget and gear. A lot mm. of people don't have gear and experience, especially in like film school as a, like a student. A lot of people don't have the experience for certain things. So you have to be teaching a lot of people a lot of things and be willing to teach people how to do a lot of stuff and like understanding everyone's learning and not trying to expect too much from people and just the limitations with budget. Yeah. Like you have to scale down your storage. You can't have some grandiose big sci-fi movie that you're trying to make when all you can get is a house location that you already have. Like, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? You have to work within your means. Yeah. And so kind of doing that is one of the hardest things. Also like, Trying to communicate your ideas effectively sometimes can be hard. Like some people just don't understand what you're trying to say with certain terms and stuff like that. Sure. Right. Um, when it comes to projects for film school, do they pitch in any money at all or is it just all up to you? Um, yeah, no, it's all so funded. Like right mm -hmm. now with as the buster I was saying, we're in the process of creating like a crowdfunding video and like a website and stuff to try to raise money for that. And like mm -hmm. we go through stuff like that and they'll teach us how to try to raise money. But for the most part, you just pitch what you got. And like mm -hmm. they do have a cage where they let people rent out gear. Um, excuse me. So you can get more gear than you would typically have access to. But like I try to avoid them. They're really annoying to work through. And mm -hmm. so I rather just have my own gear and try to do it that way, which also makes it a lot easier because you don't have to worry about breaking anything or like worrying if you can't get that same piece of gear the next day you're shooting something like that yeah right have you wondered or like had hopes of working on a feature project yeah 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 i really want to be a dp for a feature film like yeah. in the in like the near like five to six years i'm hoping to like start working on independent films and who are some mm -hmm. independent like film directors or artists that you really look up to Mm, there's a guy I was watching on YouTube named Danny Gervais. Gervais, yeah, yeah. He he just released a film. And Dude, so my friend that I had coffee with, I don't, told you we'll, we'll have him on the pod. He went to his wow, did he? Like his premiere. He's mm -hmm. like, it was nominal. Insane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's like, it's going to get picked he, up. He's the person mm -hmm. that like taught me so much that I've learned yeah. now about lighting. I, I just was absorbing all his videos like hundreds of hours over winter break i was just watching color grade lighting videos. Da, 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 da. So like he's a big inspiration like um Another one, honestly, most of the ones I used to like are now like mainstream. They've been getting picked up. Like I watched Jordan Peele's stuff before mm -hmm. and then yeah. he got picked up. Like Get Out, I saw at like Sundance and then mm -hmm. that was like pff, blew up, yeah. got picked up. Yeah. Now he's making Nope and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Man. Um, so how is it like getting picked up for these these films? Like is it an easy process or is it kind of like if you know somebody, they'll get you in or like what is that like? Um, so in like for student films anyway, like how I'm getting signed on to projects, a lot of it is people that I know. Like they'll work with me on a set, they'll see what I can do and then they'll be like, oh, I want you on my set. And that kind of just builds off that. Like most of the films I got on second semester because I was on like eight films. 
I got on from people I knew from the first semester because I only worked on two films the first semester. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of just like really who you know. And mm -hmm. if you work well with them on set and you have a good attitude, that's like one of the most important things because no one wants to work with a schmuck who's just an ass all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So having a good attitude, having like at least something you can bring to the table is a really good way to get on more sets. And like I do have a lot of gear. And that is very beneficial as a film student when gear is a very limited resource. Yeah. Like I mm -hmm. have a lot of it. <laughs> Yeah. What's something that you are usually asked to bring to a set, like, gear-wise? Um, lights. Lights. Yeah. yeah. People mm. don't have lights. Yeah. And no one really understands how important lighting is, especially oh, for cinematography. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. you don't have good lighting, you can't color grade good. And if you can't color grade good, your film just looks like every other student film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially, like, if you only rely on natural light or just, like, one key light is just yeah. like okay you're cool. so like, limited your set is gonna look like trash yeah you're so limited because yeah. what people don't realize is a lot of the lights they think is natural it's not it's natural not, at all it's yeah. multiple lights set up just in very effective ways to hide it mm -hmm. um, yeah what are you color grading in uh davinci resolve davinci yeah. i do about everything in davinci same with editing because with the black magic they're both made by the same company so right. it gives me leeway if like I do mess anything up in camera. Mm -hmm. You can like change the white balance, change the ISO. You don't typically want to change the ISO, but like more of the white balance if I screw that up, it gives mm -hmm. me the leeway to change that in post if I really wanted to. Yeah. And uh, DaVinci's just the best color getting there is. Like mm -hmm. yeah. the nodes are just so easy to do. And, like so fluid. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about Arizona State. Like, why did you choose Arizona State? Yeah, so uh, they actually just recently, at last year, it was the first year it opened, with, they built a brand new film school that was like 120,000 square feet, four sound stages. We have like three big screens to like actually show your movies, like movie-sized projectors. We have like Foley rooms, editing bays, stuff mm. like that, the cage rental. And uh, Arizona also is like becoming a big hotspot for um, yeah. Hollywood films. They have a big tax incentive to get more like film studios to come there. And there's like two big ones getting built right out to the west of Phoenix, one by like Desert Studios. They're building like a 52 soundstage acre, like on a 325 acre lot. And then another uh, smaller studio called like Acacia Film Entertainment is like building 14 sound stages. So it, mm -hmm. they're trying to really bring in a lot of business into Arizona. And I was like, hmm, if I can tap into this unlike tapped market before it like really starts to get going, like could be a good way to make connections into an industry that's kind of like over flourished with a lot of people trying to make it. You know what I mean? Like right. if you go to LA, you're just like every other person in LA trying to make it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. What's it like being an Iowa kid, like moving to Arizona? Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. I have like a little different experience because I traveled a lot more than most people did when mm -hmm. they were younger, probably. And so coming from an Iowa kid, like it's kind of what I was saying earlier. People just aren't really expecting it. They're like, they're mm -hmm. like, wow, you, you can do that. <laughs> like you're from there and you do that stuff. Like, yeah. The people are just really shocked. It's really like weird to see that like, no one expects anything cool to come from the Midwest. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like everyone just expects people to just be doing nothing here. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Um, what's like the creative scene like? Like, have you done any collaborative projects with other creatives in that's in like whether outside of school or like how do you um, network well? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The f well, honestly, most of them have just been through the school. Like, mm -hmm. a lot of people make films outside of classes as well that I've worked on and a lot of like passion short films that people do. And it's honestly really easy to make friends there because everyone in the film community there is so supportive of each other. Mm -hmm. And so everyone wants to do their best. And like, if you don't know how to do something, everyone's willing to teach you. Like, no one's going to be like, oh, you don't know how to do that. Like, you can't be on my set type thing. Like, mm -hmm. everyone's willing to get their hands dirty, like learn new things and collaborate with each other. So it's really like a very open environment. And you just have to like find your group within that and build off that. Yeah. yeah. How important is finding that group? Like, and you know, you could tell anyone being like, oh, like I feel like not included because I even feel like uh, whenever I first moved to Des Moines, I saw the creative scene and I saw like a lot of untapped potential, but I didn't really know how to get into it until I just kind of dove in head first. Yeah, I, I'd say it's like the most important thing to yeah. get into a creative community because not only will it push you out of your boundaries to continue to create more and try to like get out of a rut, you also learn so much from so many people that have so many different skills and just build off of all of that creative energy and like positivity, put that all together and you guys can just start making some amazing things happen. Mm -hmm. That's good. Who are some of the specific people like, who are some names that you would want to shout out. Shout out. Yeah. Shout out Dylan. Shout out Kurt. Shout out Luke. Shout out Jean V. Ellie. Let's All y'all are killing it. Tell yes, them sir. To, tell them to tap in. Yeah. Come, come, come to, come come to Iowa. Get on the podcast. Yeah. yeah <laughs> for real. For real. 
Um, who were some people from Des Moines, like when you were still here before you uh, went to Arizona State that uh, you got to uh, meet and that also kind of helped push you creatively? Do you Honestly, have any? Honestly, yeah. You were the first. You were the first creative Dang, I bro. actually hung out with man, in Des Moines. That's crazy. Yeah, wow, dude, man, that's, doing that, that, that feels... photo shoot was the first time I ever worked with any other person man. that was a creative in Des Moines. And then from that, I like people started to DM me. And then I started to work with uh, Robbie Audi uh, on it. That's his handle yep, on Instagram yep. and yep. his girlfriend Nina mm -hmm. started doing photos with them and then kind of just building off that and then another girl named Gabrielle I worked with her a lot and like did some photos with her What's her last name uh black okay yeah I'm, I've, I know a Gabrielle I can't remember her last name but it might yeah be the same person she calls herself joy now okay yeah so yeah yeah she's still around here yeah she cool. still does Close a lot of stuff connect. with Nina and Jason and them Mm -hmm. And they're are they in LA officially? No, they're or, actually in Urbandale here. They're in Urbandale. Yeah. They're out there a lot though. Yeah, right? yeah. They travel around a lot and do a lot of stuff out in the West, but the they're question. mainly based here. Yeah. Um, who are some cinematographers, directors, yeah. actors, like people that inspire and influence your work? Recently, Greg Frazier is one of the biggest ones. He's the cinematographer for like the Batman, Dune, mm -hmm. like uh, Rogue One, like all that. Like, cause yeah. I, I really mess with his stuff cause he has like the same style that I've always had in photography that I took over into video, which is like really darker tones, a lot of shadows, a lot of contrast. I think that looks the best. And I really like getting like shallow depth to feel like really personal with the actors. Cause I feel like it tells a more personal story about the characters. And that was kind of like the style I've developed. And I think he does the same way. Because like, if you've ever seen Rogue One, that is the prettiest looking Star Wars there it is. is. Like, yes, it that is. is just phenomenally shot. Like, mm -hmm. it's stuff like that. Also, like, uh, Roger Deakins, he's a given. He, like, mm -hmm. uh, has pretty much done most of the films you could probably think of that were popular in the last 20 years. He was a cinematographer for. But, like, one of the main ones is uh, Blade Runner. Mm. Lighting genius. Like, man, absolutely Blade Runner is insane. Fire, man. Yeah, dude. He's like a lighting master. And, like, he did No Country for Old Men, Jarhead. Like, I think pretty sure he did Forrest Gump. Like, pretty much every big movie you can think of, this man was the DP for. So, yeah. he's another big inspiration. Then, like, uh, Hoyt von Hoydeman, uh, he did like Dunkirk and stuff like that. We we have like a similar tone that we like. I like really dark blue, hard contrast tones, and he's kind of like the same like monochromatic type of style. And so mm. I really like that. And then a director that really inspires me is Wes Anderson. Mm. He mm. just I think that's a given. His style yeah. is just so unique. Yeah. Like it's really no uh, no one's doing right anything now like that. Yeah, yeah. I feel it's like definitely taken off, and a lot of people have caught on to just I don't know. It's I feel like it's uh it's something that's mimicable yeah you know and that like a lot of people they don't feel uh i don't know insecure about giving it a shot yeah you know? yeah it's just very influential oh yeah. yeah and it's interesting to see like where he started from and how he like did like stuff very conventional with hollywood but still tried to like break away a little bit in his early films like mm -hmm. he had a short film which is actually how he became famous called bottle rocket where he had like his symmetrical stuff but it was also still really doing normal Hollywood conventions like over the shoulders, like in the rule of thirds type thing. And it yeah. wasn't until like later in his career that he started to really break away from that and really just go with like symmetry and like all that focus on palette colors and like right. all that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So he's like a big inspiration as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like you would really like Eli Borgs. I feel like. Yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. We got to connect you. He, he's another filmmaker from, from Iowa. Oh, who's yeah? super talented. Yeah, yeah dude. Find something to do. After. Show me after. Yeah. yeah. Um. What are your top top five movies of all time? Man, that is a really hard question. That is. Yeah. Um, we got time. <laughs> yeah. Uh. People are gonna hate this. My like favorite one ever. Ever since I was a kid. I think it's cause I was a kid. Avatar. Like mm. James Cameron's very first Avatar. Ooh. What did you think of the new one? I thought it was amazing. Yeah. Like I absolutely liked it. phenomenal. A lot of people had gripes with the long like three minutes into introducing every scene and exiting every scene and just showing the scenery, but most people don't realize like he did that because Pandora is a character in the film. Like the whole world is a character in itself. Like mm -hmm. the whole thing's alive. Yeah. And I just find it really fascinating how he is so innovative in the Hollywood industry. Like he literally creates all the technology that he needs to make his films. And like he was the first person to really start with CGI and like the Terminator way back when. Mm -hmm. And he just built everything up from that. And like with the first Avatar, I love it so much because I just remember being like a kid, like eight or nine years old, going to see it on IMAX for the first time and just being yeah. transported into this completely other world <laughs> place. All these neon colors and flying like dragon type things. Like I was like, wow, yeah. this is insane. Yeah. Yeah. 
It was good, man. Something that makes you feel some kind of way. I think that's probably the most important way. Oh, yeah. Just way, being know? able to disconnect from the reality yeah. you're in and just escape to this Escapism. insane place. Yeah. yeah. Just yeah. imagine you could be that same thing flying on these yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Okay. So Avatar's number one. Yeah. Um, man. You don't have to give them an order to. You can just give us five. I don't know if I have now. like five favorite favorites, but like five I like can always go watch again. Blade Runner 2049. Yep. Just so beautifully shot. Yep. I love that. Um, Dunkirk's another one that was really, really well done. Scarface. I love watching Scarface. Mm-hmm. Um, and man, I don't know. I cannot. You put me on the spot, man. It's all. Put we'll come back spot. to it. Yeah. You can think about it a little bit. Um, okay. What if you if you could like be on the set of like a movie? I guess. I guess this kind of ties into that question. Yeah. Like, um, who would you want to work with in terms of like who's directing and like doing that stuff? Dennis Van- Vanilla, like, I don't know how to say. Oh, his last Denny name. Villeneuve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Dune yeah. director. Yeah, that would be insane. Yeah. Just to see how he envisions all these grandiose things mm-hmm. and makes it actually come to life. I yeah. think that would be insane. Or just like George Lucas in his prime, mm-hmm. seeing his thoughts behind creating such otherworldly things. Because I really am into sci-fi movies, and I hope to one day like be the cinematographer of a big sci-fi budget film, mm-hmm. like. So I really would just love to see how they envision these lighting scenarios and like shot scenarios and all these like very unrealistic things to us, but yeah. like realistic to their story. You know what I mean? Would you? And how would they go about developing all that? Would you right? ever want to like learn like the animation and like CGI side of things? Um, if I had to, yeah, but. I'm hoping to not ever have to. Yeah. I'm hoping just someone else can make that come to life and I can just yep. frame the shot. But if I need to, yeah. Like if I end up ever making a sci fi short, because I do also want to do that, I think we might need to cut down on budget and one of us would have to learn how to do something like that. Mm-hmm. But also mm-hmm. with like AI, I've noticed they uh, have these like really cool features coming out where you can just like mask your whole person and it'll auto track them and just completely change the, their character like as a human into a mm-hmm. robot or into like a monster and like completely mm-hmm. be fluid with the movement it's it's just starting to develop but like i think in like five ten years that thing is going to be like oh, yeah. insane oh yeah we are we are just scratching the surface oh like, yeah uh not that i think i was like the first two uh, there were probably a million but like i made a real and like posted it like the the second day that I knew Photoshop beta was out and like oh, actually yeah. like made it like uh motion. Yeah. And then I saw someone else do it like the day after. I was like, see, people are just starting to pick up that on that. Photoshop beta is insane. It's yeah. Just typing like, any prompt changes your shirt, change your yeah. leg, change the background. It's, like it's yeah. nuts. What? And like oh gosh. that's literally just V one. You know, imagine yeah. in Ten In years, three months, months, yeah, even six three months, months yeah. two years, mm-hmm. like it's it's just gonna be insane. Yeah, do you think AI is gonna affect the film industry at all? Mm, yeah, I think it's gonna affect a lot of artistry because it's gonna be hard to like really like if you just type in a prompt and it makes your whole thing come happen. Kind of takes away the whole art form of filmmaking and like mm-hmm. for example like photography like if you can just go into photoshop add this background add this and that and that right kind of just takes the whole artistry and the whole point of learning away because oh this thing just do it for me in two seconds why do i need to learn and so yeah. i think it's gonna start having some effects here in the next like five ten years and it really starts to get really honed in and mm-hmm. take away from the craft a little bit but i do also think nothing's going to really compare as well to like what a human can do. Yeah. Right? So I still think it will be there, but it will start challenging a lot of stuff we do on our normal daily lives. Yeah. Do you use it in any kind of like efficient or like practical way? Um, I like to use ChatGPT to read essays and like okay. read articles because all these classes just be assigning so many articles that yep. I, like I have bad ADHD. I don't got the time to sit there. I just can't focus. Right. So I'm like summarize this and then boom, that's tells cool. me exactly what it's about with like the main points. And I'm like that's what I mainly use it for. But mm-hmm. that's dope. Yeah, I do know like a lot of people have been using it for school and schools are starting to catch on and like put in like uh, AI to like detectors and yep. stuff like that. People getting yeah. caught doing that stuff. Yeah. Dang. Have you um. Have you used anything like uh, Discord or anything like for like image creating? I have not used it for image creating. No, I mm. use like mainly like Photoshop, Lightroom, okay. stuff like that. Yeah, cool. yeah. Um, like Mid Journey, me and my boss, um, he got really good at like just like knowing what prompts to use. Yeah, and I don't, I don't use it very much, but sometimes I'll just like go into like the, um, 
you know, just the platform and like read what everyone else is yeah. creating. And it's real interesting mm-hmm. how like how detailed people have to be with their prompts. And I think that's also like a thing that we've talked about before is why that might replace some people's jobs, but it might just like turn turn like an aspect of like what people do differently. Like, you know, now we'll have AI transcribing audio, yeah. which is great. You know, even Premiere and DaVinci have a AI or a, I don't know if it's AI based, but like a transcription like editor mm-hmm. where you can just like scrub to that word, take it out, whatever. But like people are going to have to get really good at using those prompts. Yeah. And, like, oh, yeah. Now that the you creativity. S- yeah. yeah. Now that you said that, I actually even remembered I used the AI actually to create images for a pre visualization of a storyboard. Yeah. Because, yeah. Because mm. I couldn't like, I'm not a good drawer. Like, yeah, that's I'm not what the I best. Um, yeah. Justin Meyer, mm-hmm. um, he and I talked about that, and I've done that a couple times, and his conceptualizing was really unique. So, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that's going to cut down a lot of time, make things really more efficient. Yeah, too. and it's definitely going to kill some people's jobs, though, for mm-hmm. sure. Like, taking the artistry out of, like, the, getting the dude to actually draw all these images for right. the frame yeah. and all that. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's true. Speaking of storyboarding and stuff, like, what is like a typical process like when it comes to kind of that pre-production stuff like what are the steps that you or your film crew uh like writers people Mm -hmm. what what do you guys do in terms of like creating steps uh that you kind of like check off as you go like okay we got this done we got this done now we can move on to like actually shooting now we can move on to post like what does that process look like yeah so um to start typically Normally in the film school, the writer will be the director, and that's most of the cases that I've dealt with. And so typically it'll be that, and then I get signed on as a DP, and then I'll work with the director very heavily to like collaborate on a shot list because a lot of times they have their own set vision, and then I try to give some input because ultimately I get control a little bit of what visually happens. Like I'll I'll normally stick with their main idea, but I'll tell start telling them I think this could work, I don't think this would work, I think this could be better, something like that, and then we'll collaboratively work on the shot list together and kind of break that down. And from there, we'll go through a few stages of that and then start working on a storyboard off the shot list once we get it finalized and start looking at more locations that we think we can get. And normally that's kind of also done beforehand when you're making the script. You kind of make it around what you know and think you can get. And then uh, we'll start going to places. And I have this app on my phone that can start showing me what different things would look like with different lenses on. Oh, what app is Mm. that? Oh, man. I I think I've used that. Um, I can't remember what it's called, but... No, I can't remember either, dude. Hold on. That sounds like a really useful. Yeah, tool, it's like it's like an app that'll show you like what a uh, what a shot will look like at which focal length, um, like where the lighting is coming in from. Mm. Um, so like you'll I use like, it. It's called Director's Viewfinder. Yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. I use. Yeah, mm. um, really helpful. Oh yeah, yeah and really. there's another one I use for cinematography called Sunseeker. Tells you the, the, posi- I, the position of the, of the sun, sun throughout the day. day. Yeah, yeah. Mm. so you can know where to place your actors and where you need diffusion and this and that. Yeah, yeah. Mm. and Super you can even like, that. I mean, you can plan that out well in advance, which is really helpful oh, if, yeah. if you're scheduling a shoot. I've used that a couple times for photo shoots and be like, all right, where am I gonna want to actually like shoot? You know, at what oh, time yeah. and use what fill and um, you know, everyone like you know. Everyone loves shooting in golden hour, so it's like, okay. Like, yeah, it's a little overused. Yeah, it's yeah. like, all right, cool. How can I, like, shoot in broad button? daylight and make it look way better? Exactly. Yeah. That's what, like, I did for a, an engagement shoot, like, six months ago. And I'm like, I'm, I'm just going to shoot at, like, 3 p.m. And I will add everything. Yeah, I feel <laughs> like a lot of people are scared to take on the battle of broad daylight. Yeah. But really, all it is is add more diffusion or add more negative fill. Exactly. That's, the, that's easy as that. Just mm-hmm. conquered that way. Um, how important is collaboration? Like you mentioned, uh, collaborating with yeah. like the director and like uh, maybe presenting some different ideas that they didn't see and being like, "This might work better." Um, how important is collaboration? Because I feel like some people out there are like, "No, nah, it's my way or the highway." But yeah. like, what's your take on in that? In film, collaboration is key. If you're my way or the highway, no one's gonna work with you again because yeah. you're just gonna be too difficult and no one's gonna want to. It's Mm -hmm. literally the only way to make your film happen because like just on a film I did for a class where I was the director and the cinematographer, I had like 
12 or 13 people on it. Like I had two, like a gaffer, I had an assistant, a, like a, a producer, AD, like second AC, first AC. Like I had to manage the actors. I had to have a PA. Like I had all kinds of people working for me. Like if you don't have all these people willing to help you, like you can't do all that yourself. Like there's yeah. too many hats that you would have to be wearing and you can't make a film yourself because you're thinking about so much different things all at once. And like even just being a director and cinematographer, I, I'm never doing that again. Right. That was just, mm. I couldn't focus on both of them at the same time. And I, I put more emphasis into the cinematography and I wasn't doing a good enough job directing the actors. You're too so, spread thin. Yeah you, need, yeah, you need to have like your one set thing and then have a bunch of other people help you communicate that and then have that come to life because you just can't do it yourself. Mm -hmm. Is it like really fast paced and high energy on set like do you feel pressure or is it pretty chill for the most part um when i was the director i felt pressure because you have to answer to everyone like you have to tell everyone what they're doing kind of give everyone the idea of you need to do this you need to go here do that so there's pressure in that sense but when i'm typically a dp i really only have to talk to the director and then work with like where i want these lights and what I need to do and what my camera department needs to do. So it's not super high pressure and I've been on enough and I'm confident enough in my skills where I and my camera and I know my camera well enough where like I'm pretty fluid now with it. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, yeah, it was a little scary mm -hmm. because you just don't want to mess up. Yeah. Do you have any like experiences where you have messed up or like some bad experiences that you've learned from? Oh yeah, dude. I like kept on an ND in one of the most important shots of this film we did and I didn't catch it until we were completely done and the actors had left oh, and no. it was literally the most important shot of the whole film and we just <laughs> <laughs> had to accept the L. That yeah. was one thing and then yeah. another thing I've done is actually not my privilege film. It looks like it's calculated but there's like a shot where it's only focused on this doorknob and he's like walking to leave for work mm -hmm. and then his sister comes out but it was supposed to be focused on him and then fo rack focused to the sister mm. But I messed up and I didn't notice it because like I didn't have enough light, so I couldn't read the peaking on mm. the screen. It was just all kind of red, so I couldn't yeah. really tell what was in focus and what wasn't. Mm. And then that messed up. But there's like little things like that that I've been trying to learn from, and that's where I went into like light is so important and like remembering to take my dang ND filter off. Yeah, mm, yeah, because it ruined the most important shot of a film. Yeah, do you feel like you're just like becoming a more detail-oriented person through, like, all those experiences. Yeah. I'm starting to nitpick a lot of, like, what I do and, like, try yeah. to really focus on the little things because those little things all add up to the big thing. And if you keep messing up the little things, the big thing won't turn out as good. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Um, how do you uh, how do you unplug from everything? Like, and how important is that to you? Um, Pretty much right now, I don't, to be honest. Like, yeah. I've just been so like hyper focused on diving into film as deep as I can and making as many connections as I can and just being a part of every single possible thing I can and practicing as much as I can that like right now I don't disconnect but sometimes like when you're on a set for like three days in a row the whole weekend like it does get a little draining because like the days if you're on like like for my privilege we had like three shoot days and they were like nine hour days and mm -hmm. that's like a typical for most sets you'll mm -hmm. be there eight nine ten hours like but I think it's fun. So it's it's really like after like the third day, you're like, dang, I am tired. But like, man, that was fun. We just yeah. created something really cool. Got to hang out with our friends the whole time. To just bond and create like a really awesome thing collaboratively together. Like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So I try not to disconnect from it just because I love it so much. Sure. Yeah. So like, do you have any other hobbies or anything that you like get inspiration from or just like disconnect for, for like even be like, okay, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take this time to do something else, whether it's like... I mean, photography or like writing or anything like oh, that. Oh, yeah. I like I like to write. I like going to museums. I get a lot of inspiration for like artistry from paintings. Like okay. I just mm. love to look at paintings. Like I could spend hours in museums looking at sculptures and paintings because like also what a lot of people don't even realize is how many other cinematographers pull from paintings. I was going to say use that. that in films. Yeah. Yeah. Like you could just literally Google paintings that have actually been used in film shots. Like and you'll just see a whole list of them of like creative mm -hmm. things because like Paintings are very surreal in a lot of situations. And, oh, 100%. And you can really take so many things people do and convert that into film and make some incredible looking shots. Yeah. Man, it's crazy. Like, we talked about it with some other people we've had on the podcast, but it's like people really be recycling some of the same ideas, but like they just put their own spin on it. And yeah. it's such a fresh like spin on it that it doesn't feel like you know, what it, what it came from. No, literally, I think that's honestly one of the coolest things about being an artist is just taking 
an idea and then being like, I think I can do that better or I think I can do it this way and then just trying it and seeing what happens. Like mm-hmm. That's one of the things I do quite often, especially with films. I'll like see someone's idea. I'm like, hmm, that's a cool premise, but I think I can do that better. And then I'll take a shot idea or like a film idea, like the film I did um, for one of the classes that I would like to direct for again. It was called like Fresh Air and it, I got that idea because of a film in Iowa that I had seen where they were on a porch talking and I was like, I think I can do that better than they did and I just made like a really simple script about it and I made it just so I could shoot it really nice and like easy and that was what I built it off of but I feel like it came out as what I expected it to be. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Um, I know you travel a lot Yeah. and I, I mean, you're in Arizona now. You said your sister just moved to New York, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so you do a lot of traveling Uh how what is that like and does that help you also stay inspired a little bit like getting out yeah i have a really hard time sitting still i don't like being in the same (laughs) place very long i need to like get new ideas and freshen up from other things and like because like i had mentioned earlier my sister was on broadway when i was really young so i was like fortunate enough to travel a lot like when uh, she started out in like chicago for a year so i spent five months in chicago then it moved to toronto i lived in toronto for five months and then it traveled around the country for the next two years and so for like the five months over summer during in between years i was traveling with them and wherever that went and so i was able to experience a lot more stuff and then once I went to New York and did that acting experience, I was able to like meet a bunch of people from all different kinds of countries. And I was mm-hmm. like, oh, this is really cool. And I had like friends I could stay with now. So I was like, I'm just gonna work my like ass off, get a bunch of money and travel. And that's honestly how I got into photography too. Cause I was inspired by Jay Alvarez, if you know him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was like, man, this, I was, when I was like 16, I was like, this dude is just traveling all over the place, taking cool ass photos. I want to do that. Mm-hmm. And so that was like, honestly, why I even got a camera. And then me and my mom went on this trip to Arizona and I realized, wow, people cannot take photos for me. So I'm just gonna have to learn myself. <laughs> yeah. Cause I was like, they just do not look like Jay Alvarez's. And then <laughs> from there, I was like, all right, taught myself how to like put it on a tripod. Like you're a beast of that, bro. Dude, appreciate like, it, man. You're self Portraits, man. It. it just it looks like someone is like just up there taking it for you. Appreciate but it, dude. It's crazy. You just know like the angles and everything. Thanks, man. Yeah, no, yeah. like that was one of the first things Nina and Jason said when they met me too. They were like trying to figure out who was taking my photos. Like, no, nah, that's just me and a tripod, man. Yeah. That's awesome, just all man. on self timer. We're like on my phone now. I have an app that I can just click it, drop the phone, take yeah. the photo. But yeah, it was from that, and then I ended up being with this girl who lived in France and Cambodia and it gave me the opportunity to like travel to Europe and Asia quite a bit Mm -hmm. and then from there my love for travel just really took off because I was experiencing so many different things like I was 17 and went to Cambodia yeah like most people don't be doing that right (laughs) yeah and so from there it just grew into never wanting to sit still like I just want to see so much of the world now like yeah what are some of the favorite places that you visited Ooh, definitely like Southeast Asia like pretty much every country that I've been to. I've been to Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, Cambodia, all of those places. So, so, so cool. Mm -hmm. Like the beaches are amazing in Thailand. Like Mm -hmm. so sick. And Bangkok is just a chaotic city. That's also what I like about Southeast Asia. It's it's very chaotic in its own way. Like Mm -hmm. there's so much traffic and random stuff going on that you just have to like, send it in the yeah. streets a lot of the time just hope for the best <laughs> people just move great. around That's you yeah. yeah it's just so different from what you're used to seeing here in america that it's just really interesting and it's interesting to think that like most people would say oh those places are probably like third world they don't got nothing going on yeah they have like some of that aspects but there is still like a lot of stuff happening in a lot of these quote-unquote third world countries that people sure, don't realize sure. and i think the u.s media really puts a skewed image of a lot of places in people's heads than mm-hmm. what the actual reality is on the ground if you actually went there. Yeah. What's um, some of your bucket list places that you want to visit? Oh, man. Definitely want to hit Jordan, Saudi Arabia, mm-hmm. Egypt, like the Middle East I really want to hit. And then uh, I really want to go to Norway. Like mm-hmm. during the winter time, see the Northern Lights, that'd be sick. Yeah. Um, South Africa, uh, Namibia. That's another cool one. And like Australia. There's so much cool stuff in Australia. I love uh, Australian accents. Dude, so right? Shout out yeah. Pastor Jesse. Right? Yeah. <laughs> shout out Jesse. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's a country that you would want to film in? Mm. Jordan. Jordan? Yeah. I was going to guess that when Definitely you said Definitely Jordan. It. Right? Yeah. right now, I'm just so inspired by the desert, bro. Yeah. Because like, I'm also learning about that in school and living in a desert now. I'm just like, oh, desert film. Do you get so cool. opportunities to like shoot out like off 
off site and stuff like that? Oh, yeah. Most of the times when you shoot, it's not on film or not on the school grounds. Cool. We get taught to like, we get really hammered in on getting permits at that at Arizona. And so, like, if we want to film anywhere on campus, you need a permit. If you want to film at any building, you need to get permission and like permits and show it to your professor. And before you will leave, they'll even let you check out gear or anything. I don't really need to check out gear from the school, but like, it's a good practice or a good habit to practice for yeah. like when you go into the actual business because like, if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to get fired. Sure. Mm-hmm. So, for anyone who might want to try to do that on their own short film, what is what is getting a permit look like? Um, there's a website called Studio Binder that's really helpful for like learning a lot about pre production, and cool. you can get a lot of documents from there that look pretty professional. But honestly, I just Google like location agreement template, look at which one you kind of like, what kind of flows with you, put in your info of like you're gonna film, you want to film at this business on this date, doing this, and a lot of them will explain like already that like I'm a student, I cannot afford to pay, but we'll give you recognition in the film, yada yada, and you kind of just go to the the building, ask for the manager or like. If it's a mom and pop shop, you just call them and ask if they'd be willing to let you film there and kind of explain what your idea is. And then they'll either say yes or no. And if they say yes, I would recommend like doing your best to be as respectful as you can in case, especially like in our case, if we get somewhere around Tempe, we have to do the best that we can because we're representing the school. And like if we're a bunch of annoying kids, then they're not going to want anyone else to shoot there again. Right. It kind of hinders the future of production being made in certain places. And so mm. it's honestly just like kind of getting growing up and calling and being like, hey, do you think I can film here type thing? Yeah. yeah. That's mm-hmm. dope. Yeah. Well, if we ever go to Arizona, we're going to have to link with you. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. and exactly. do something. I don't yeah. know what we would I do. I got but. family out in um, Surprise. I don't know how far that is from Tampa, I'm not sure but, either. Um, mm-hmm. It's like 25 minutes, I think, north of Phoenix. Oh, okay. So you're only like 30 minutes away then. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. What is your next steps after Arizona State? First of all, let me ask, like, when are you graduating? Um, I technically graduate fall of 24, but I only need, like, four credits that semester because our, like, senior project is, like, three semesters long. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I'll technically graduate then, but I'm going to be pretty much done with school. And so I'm going to try to get a job at, like, production companies and hopefully get into the scene there. And then from there, we'll do freelance for a couple years and then kind of just see where that goes because, I mean, like, it's hard to really tell where you're going to be in a field like this when there's just like so much uncertainty. Mm-hmm. And so kind of just trying to put myself in a position to get towards working on bigger sets and bigger, like bigger things. Yeah. Cool. Are you going to try and stay in Arizona or are you going to look into other states? Um, For the first like year at least, I think I'm going to stay in Arizona after I graduate. Um, mm-hmm. Just because of the developing film pro- like scene there, I want to see how that actually comes about and like how much attention the studio is actually bringing in. Mm-hmm. Um, but if that doesn't really work, I'm probably going to go to LA. Yeah. Cause I do know a couple people that have graduated from other colleges that are now going out there working on sets and stuff like that. And like, that's where a lot of ASU alumni goes just straight to LA mm-hmm. working on like camera crews and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, what are your goals like in two years, five years and 10 years? I know you kind of mentioned like in five to six years, you want to like DP, like, yeah. uh, like a feature film. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm hoping to like eventually in a couple of years, start working more with independent directors and like people like that and DP those types of films. And from there, hopefully we get into some festivals, pick up some traction. And then I hopefully in the end, my end end goal is to be working on like a big sci-fi film in Hollywood. Like, I don't know what it is yet, Yeah, but something like that I think would be really, really cool. Cause I just love the idea of playing with like cyberpunk colors and mm-hmm. like the grandiose idea of the future. I think it's a really cool concepts. Yeah. I love that. That's dope. Okay. What's some advice that you would give someone looking to get into what you want to do? Um, Practice as much as you can because practice will trump talent every single time. And use YouTube to your advantage as much as you can. YouTube University is the greatest thing Thanks. in the entire world. It has taught me more than the film school has in terms of actual production stuff. Mm. That's interesting that yeah. you say that because... Mm. We've had people with degrees. We've had people who are completely self-taught. You know, I, I've i never taken a single class on videography, on cinematography, directing, anything yeah. like that. Everything that I've learned in the film industry has been from YouTube and from mentors. Yeah, no, that's honestly about the same. Like, I learned a lot of the basics from the school, but like in terms of lighting and color grading and 
knowing how to do all that, it's all just been in YouTube University and like what lenses go work with what cameras, what does this, what does that, just YouTube, 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 because that's how I taught myself how to do photos in the beginning and how to yeah. graphic design it was all just YouTube. Mm. That's dope. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Awesome, man. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. being on, yeah, man. No problem. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. We end every episode uh, with the same question that we all get to answer, and it's what's something that has inspired us recently? Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. No, you want to go first? Yeah, I guess. (laughs) Um, So something that has inspired me recently, uh, I got to say my girl Maggie, uh, Somo Studios, she's Mm -hmm. a graphic designer uh, here in Des Moines, and I do graphic design, so like I'm always, you know, looking at that kind of stuff for inspiration. And she recently uh, did branding for like a new clothing company called like Esther. And uh, she shared like the logo she did and some of those things um, on her Instagram. And it's just really like well done. And like seeing her logo like in like a, it was, I think they made like a knit sweater where they like knit the logo on. I'll have to show oh, y'all. Yeah, yeah. I think sick. I saw what, yeah. It's like a women's athleisure wear line or something like that. It shouldn't be because it's sick. I know. I was going to say, I will buy one of yeah. those sweaters myself, <laughs> yeah. man. Like it's crazy. So yeah, she really killed that. And um, so yeah, I would say Maggie really inspired me. That's dope. Yeah. Um, recently I went to Minnesota for a conference, um, and hung out with a bunch of dope people. Um, and it was dope to like, uh, be in a place that has like a a big creative scene, um, see like a bunch of other creatives and stuff like that. Um, and then talking to my friend, um, you know, shout out Wes, he's actually moving to LA to pursue, cinematography full time Uh, Mm. his wife is a creative director super talented couple um but like just see like talk to him and talk about like his future but also like gain some inspiration from like what he's doing um other people who like just are talented writers and musicians and cinematographers and um but also like see that what we're doing like podcast wise and just what we're doing overall as a creative community in Des Moines is like seriously on the rise. Like no. it's, it's mm-hmm. really inspiring. Just like go to somewhere that is more established, if you will, like they have like a deeper creative culture. If you want to, I guess, specify that, um, you know, and like, even like, like a lot of their fashion is like, uh, you know, inspired from like LA or like New York or just, you know, one of the coasts, but like Min- Minneapolis has like that culture as well and see like a lot of that still in Des Moines too. It's like, oh, we're not that far off from New Yeah, York. no, honestly, you know? that would lead into my answer because I'm going to say the biggest thing that's inspired me is how much the creative scene has changed here in the last year. Like yeah. hmm, podcasts were not any within that I was yeah. thinking about a year ago and like, <laughs> There's now this, people making clothing brands, like doing really good stuff, like shout out Eli, his, mm-hmm. his brand yeah. Uncertified, that is yeah. insane. I, I was about to say, I saw yeah, your I got the bracelet, yeah. can't, so, can't yeah. put that out there, so under, not, not, not release really tips, <laughs> but uh, yeah, dude. He's like, going to crack up when he hears that. Yeah, I know, man. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> We're having him on soon, right? Hopefully. Yeah, we're talking about it, yeah. We're trying to get the stars to align. That'd yeah. be sick. No, yeah, yeah. but the, yeah, the creative scene has been blowing up here, and like a lot more people are getting involved in photography and like becoming models here and it's just really cool to see like the community actually starting to grow and come together and people actually finding each other more now because 100%. i just remember a couple years ago i didn't even know there was a scene here at all like yeah mm-hmm. it was so underground and now like hopefully especially with this it gives more people like influence like yeah maybe i should step out of my comfort zone yeah. dm that person ask that person to do this something like that so this is just really cool to see yeah it you know recently i feel like I see a lot of the young upcoming people, but also I'm starting to like, like meet a lot of the OGs too yeah. that have been around. Like they've been creative before social media was really like a thing. Mm-hmm. And, and now I'm now just starting to find out who they are because of like social media. And so it's kind of cool to see like, yeah, like the scene has been like really underground, but I feel like now like, I don't know. Everyone's just popping up out of nowhere. And like every time we're trying to get guests to come on here, I'm like, 
yo, this person's sick. Like, how oh, have yeah. I never heard of them before? Like, whatever, you know? Yeah. It's just, it's cool, man. So that yeah, is dope. It, That's like, yeah. definitely inspiring. When new guests come on, you meet, hear about their friends, think, oh, yeah, there's a new person, you know? Yeah. 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 There's so many people, and, and it's so connected here. Like, that's something you don't also realize. Everyone knows everyone once you start actually getting into the scene. Right. Yeah. And it's yeah. just, like, really cool to see everyone, like, start bonding and, like, really making some cool stuff here. Yeah. yeah. That's what I hope our end goal is, is just, like, networking people and, like, connecting people you know, yeah. at least, yeah, that's yeah. what I'm hoping, you know, we do. Yeah. So, yeah. Thanks for being on, dude. Yeah, no this problem. Thanks fun. for having me, dude. This was good. Yeah. Cool. This has been another episode of the Creos POV podcast. We'll see you in the next one.